Hello, welcome back to the Brother Blog. Sorry for missing out on the uh, last couple months and uh, the last half of the regular season, but uh, our video editing software broke, so we couldn't really make videos, I guess. But uh, everything's good now. We got iMovie 11, so we're all set to go for this season when we won't disappoint. Without further ado, please enjoy our news video on breaking down the WAC and the Mountain West. Well, I mean, there's not much to say about the WAC to the average college football guru, but I'm going to be here today to tell you guys a little bit about the WAC situation and how Hawaii could somehow end up in the BCS mix. Also in the Mountain West, we all know that Boise State has made their move on trying to get into, I guess, a better situation in the BCS. And TCU is trying to get out, but they aren't out yet, and they will have to face Boise State this season, so the battle of the non-AQs should be a good one. I'm going to start out with the Mountain West, which is obviously the conference that most people look at when they see, hear non-AQ. I mean, TCU, the last two years, has made it to the BCS last year, upsetting Wisconsin in the Rose Bowl. That was a great game. And, uh, you know, I'll be honest, I did not expect that. I thought that Wisconsin would come out and beat them. As you all know, I'm not really a big TCU fan. But this year, I see potential in them, and I see that they could make a – Dash added, I don't think a national title though, and I will explain. Let's look at the pros of TCU first. Their running duo comes back, Ed Wesley and Matthew Tucker, each return. And, I mean, the two of them put together, you just can't stop them. The running game has been good there forever. Andy Dalton did leave, and uh, he's going to be tough to replace. But I think that those two can carry the boatload for the offense. I mean... 1,078 yards for Ed Wesley, 709 for Matthew Tucker, and a combined 18 touchdowns between the two. So, you know, the offense, I don't see that being much of a problem, and I think that Gary Patterson always finds a way to build a real strong defense. You look at TCU's program over the last couple of years, even when they didn't make it to the BCS, they still had a very solid defense. I think they're more of a defensive-based system, not so much thinking just put up points on the board like you know teams like the Hawaii we saw in 2005 I think that was maybe 2006 I'm not sure but uh, you look back to some of those other teams and they aren't as sustainable I guess would be the term they can't go that whole season winning games because the defense is really the thing you have to rely on when you're going through a season like that but let's look at their cons now I don't think they have a hard enough schedule to get into the national title. I mean, that I expect them to be ranked somewhat high at the uh, preseason polls, but uh, I mean, I Baylor. That's your only out of conference foe who's actually good. I mean, Baylor isn't even that good. I mean, Robert Griffin the third. I got respect for him, but everybody else on Baylor, you know, I can't see it happening that TCU can get into the big national title game with that type of schedule strength. And, you know, I don't know if this is a pro or a con. You can go sort of either way, but Boise State's in their conference now, so they're going to have to compete with Boise State. And uh, without further ado, let's move on to Boise State. The pros for Boise State is Kellen Moore does return, and uh, he, he was a big factor, obviously, in last season and the season before when they won the Fiesta Bowl. So it would not surprise me one bit if they went on to the BCS. Seven starters on offense return and seven starters on defense return. And Chris Peterson says that this defense could be the best defense Boise State has ever seen, which is a very strong statement because last season I believe they were second in points allowed. And, uh, I mean, when you're giving up 12 points a game, or 10 points a game, you know, you aren't going to lose unless your offense isn't producing them. With a guy like Kellen Moore underneath the center, you're going to win games if your defense can hold up. 
And, I mean, now they got a somewhat stronger schedule. They play Georgia at the beginning of the season. And Georgia isn't, you know, some big school, but they are in the SEC. So, you know, and Brigham Young, we don't know what they're going to do. I mean, they aren't independent, but I just, I don't have faith in them. But uh, they now have to actually face some better teams in their conference. You look back at Boise State in the last few years, and, uh, you know, they win those first two or three games, and they just coast through the rest of the year. And, uh, you know, it's kind of sad to see that that's the team that gets to play in the BCS game over, you know, a Big Ten team who lost two games because they actually have to play every single week. And, I mean, that's really my only standpoint why the BCS has an argument on these 9 AQs not going in. But um, I think that the Boise State TCU winner should get a bid in the BCS dance. And, uh... I'm going to break down that game for you right now. A couple things I looked back on the TCU season is they did go undefeated, but they did struggle against San Diego State. That was a great game, and uh, it was the closest game. Most points put up against TCU was 35, and it was them. So I've come to the conclusion that TCU struggles against the pass over a long period of time. Vincent Brown, wide receiver for San Diego State last season, tore them apart. And uh, if Boise State can find a receiver who can play like Titus Young did or Austin Pettis did, then I think that this game could go to Boise State. But then you go to Boise State, and Boise State can struggle against the run if it's thrown at them over long periods of time. You look at Nevada's offense in that game, and Nevada was trying to run the football. You could tell in the beginning of the game they just could not get it going, and then Something started in the second half. Their defense just, it wasn't strong enough. I mean, this is the thing why I don't think Boise State is going to beat TCU. TCU, like I said, sustainable. They have to be able to play constantly throughout the season in every single game if they should deserve a spot in the national championship. And Boise State, Nevada, you look at that game, Boise State played the first half and sat out the second half until Doug Martin had that I mean, I don't know, 80-yard touchdown reception or whatever. God, I mean, I was crying at that point. It was just like, you know, I was watching that game, and it was crazy. But, uh, you know, Boise State, once they get into that second half, they aren't used to still having to play at that point in the season. I don't think they're going to be mentally prepared, you know, that quick. I, I don't know. I think that the TCU game, they should be able to stay more sustainable in the third quarter. But come fourth quarter, that team's going to be tired, and TCU just does not quit. And uh, so, like I said, Boise State struggles against the run over long periods of time. You just keep hammering them. And then I think TCU's going to have more to play for in this game. TCU's last season in the Mountain West, this is going to be pretty much the Mountain West title game, I think we can all say. And uh, you go back to the Fiesta Bowl a couple years ago, that was their first BCS bid in I think it might have been their first BCS bid, but uh, I mean, I'm not completely sure on that. But they lost that game. That was a tough one. Uh, but it is played in Boise State. And so you size things up. It's all going to come down to who can have the bigger impact player, who can have somebody emerge midway through the season. I mean, we just never know that. You look at the Heisman winners in the last few years, and I mean, Cam Newton. I mean, who knew of him at the beginning of the season? Obviously, us at the Brother Blog, we had heard about him because we follow the recruiting and all that. But, I mean, just you go back to the previous Heisman Trophy winners and they're all people who emerge and lead their teams. And I think that if TCU can find a quarterback who can do that, they could find themselves in a BCS situation. Now, moving on to the WAC, obviously not as competitive as the Mountain West, but Hawaii and Nevada will be competing for the Western Athletic Conference title this season, and I don't think Nevada has any shot at a BCS bid. I'm sorry. I'm, you know, big Nevada fan, but uh, when I saw the schedules come out, they play Oregon in that first game, and I just, I can't see it, you know. I can't see it in a million years. Tyler Landtrip, first game really as the starter, as the leader, of the team, and 
you know, to play against Oregon, who almost won the national title last season. That's going to be a blowout. I mean, I hate to say it, but it will be. And then, you know, you look at Hawaii, and their only out-of-conference, you know, strength, I guess, is Colorado and Washington. And Washington, after losing Jake Locker, it should not be that tough. Colorado coming in from the Big 12 could be a challenge. First game of the season, though, Bryant Moniz, who was their quarterback last season, threw for the most yards. I think it was 5,040. I want to say not completely sure on that number. But uh, he comes back for Hawaii, and he's really good. I think that he should be able to tear up Colorado's defense and also Washington's defense and get Hawaii some national spotlight going. But, uh, you know, Hawaii and Nevada, I think, would be the biggest game for Hawaii. And breaking down that game, you look at the weapons on each side. Neither of them really have a really solid defense. Hawaii's never really been a defensive-based team. Nevada had Dante Moak last season, who was a defensive end, outside linebacker type player. But he's out to the NFL draft now. So I'm looking at the offensive weapons. And Brian Moniz and Tyler Landtrip, obviously you give it to Brian Moniz. But Tyler Landtrip does have a running game behind him. He has Lanford Mark and Mike Ball, who weren't the starters for last season. They did flip off every now and then with Vitawa, and uh, would not surprise me one bit if Nevada could pull off an upset. I do see that Hawaii makes it undefeated up until they play Nevada. And, uh, you know, I see the biggest talent, though, in Nevada still in that wide receiver core. And they got Rashard Mast. Use ah, sorry, and they also had Brandon Wimberly. If you can recover, he got shot in the leg. But uh, you know, if those two can make, if Wimberly can make it back, and if Rashard Matthews can show up like he did when he played against Boise, I mean, he had ten catches for I think 170 yards. Not sure on that, but I mean, he he had a heck of a game. I just remember that, and he had that rushing touchdown on the wide receiver reverse which, I mean, had me jumping off the couch going crazy. But, uh, you know, I think that if Nevada's big players can show up to the game like they did against Boise State, and I think that if they had that emotion, Nevada will have that emotionally charged energy just because, first of all, you know, well, for both of them, it's their last really big chance at a whack title. But... I mean, arguably, Nevada could have made it to the BCS talk if uh, Hawaii had not beaten them last season. So, I mean, when teams, you know, beat other teams, they got that bitter taste in their mouth, you know? And I just don't think that Hawaii would come out of that game. But either way, I think that this would be a great game to watch, regardless of whether or not Hawaii is still undefeated or Nevada's, you know, even any good. I think that these two match up pretty well, and it'd be exciting. So uh, those are the Mountain West and Western Athletic Conferences broken down, the two biggest games in those conferences in my eyes broken down. And uh, if you have any comments, feedback, feel free to post them. Thanks for watching.